Good afternoon from Ghana, and welcome to this preview session of the World Cocoa Foundation's 2020 Partnership Meeting. The main program starts on Wednesday. My name is Buddy Buruku, and it is my sincere pleasure to be your host over the next few days. Before we begin today's program, I would like to thank our gold sponsor, Mondelez International, as well as all our sponsors who have made this event possible. I would also like to um, cover some important housekeeping to make this event as enjoyable and smooth as possible for everyone. First, we want all our attendees to have access to our full Zoom functionality. Below me, under this screen, you will find a sentence with a link to use the Zoom app. The sentence reads, if you are experiencing audio issues, use the Zoom app instead. But whether you are experiencing issues or not, please, we want everyone to use this link. So please click on it now. This will take you to a Zoom window. When the Zoom window opens, you might be prompted for a password. This means your version of Zoom is a bit outdated. So please go ahead and update it. Got it? Great. If at any point during the partnership meeting, you encounter any technical challenges, you have access to technical support through the partnership meeting platform. Go to account slash get support at the top of your screen. We'll leave the guidance up on the slides so that you always know what to do. Okay. Now that we are all in the Zoom window, we are, right? Let's talk about submitting questions. Today's is an interactive session, so we, so we encourage your participation. You can do this by clicking on the chat bubble to send your questions to all panelists. Before I introduce our speakers, I would like to highlight some actions that you can take to maximize on the utility of the partnership meeting platform after this session and throughout the week. First, you can use the platform to connect with new and old acquaintances. Look your best and upload your picture, just like I have. Use the account tab to access your profile and make any changes you see fit. Check the attendees list under the people tab to see who's around. Click on names and make appointments. You can schedule meetings and engage with participants all while staying inside the platform. No need for emails. The platform is also the venue for all the great partnership meeting content. Go ahead and check the agenda under the schedule tab to see what we have in store for you on any given day. Breakout sessions do have limited capacity though, so do reserve your spot in advance. Worried you'll miss a session? Don't be. We are recording all sessions and these will be available under agenda shortly after being live. Finally, we want to hear from you. On the platform, you can use the conversations tab to send private or public messages. Let people know on social media that you are here. Kindly use hashtag WCFPM and tag at World Coco. So without further ado, let me introduce our esteemed speakers who will cover key findings of the 2020 Coco Barometer. Anthony Fountain, Managing Director of the Voice Network, and Friedel Hutz Adams, Senior Researcher at Zudvind Institute. Anthony and Friedel, welcome to you both. Thanks. Thank you, buddy. Um, I'm not share screen. It's always a um, an interesting moment when you have to start doing things online versus in real life. Those of you that know me know that I prefer to do things in real life. But here we go. Um, our first World Coca Foundation partnership meeting online. I am hoping that you guys can all see the opening slide of our screen. Buddy, could you nod if that is the case, just to make sure that we've got the great. It's wonderful to have you all here. Um, Friedel and myself, the, the two authors for the Coco Barometer, will be walking you through um, the key findings of the Coco Barometer. 
Now, every time we draft one of these barometers, they become larger and larger because more and more is taking place in the cocoa sector. That means that we can also not go into every detail on every topic. Um, but what we are going to try to do today is share key, key findings, but particularly also to engage with all of the people in this call in an open dialogue. Now, sounds a little bit strange because we're going to have to do that through the Q&A field, but that is exactly how we want to be doing this. And so if you have any questions, if you have anything that you would like to mention, please put it in the Q&A field. I'm afraid I'm going to be reading out the questions or Friedel will be um, because we don't have the technical capacity to allow you to ask your questions directly, but we will try to do you as much justice as possible. We are going to be breaking this session into four identical or four separate parts, going into four different topics, short introduction, four or five minutes, maybe 10 per introduction, and then an extensive Q&A. Um, so if you feel that we haven't had the topic yet, it might come later. Um, we will be discussing issues around living income, around human rights, specifically child labor, around environmental protection, looking at issues like deforestation, agroforestry, and the use of agrochemicals. And then we will be rounding off with a conversation around the necessary enabling environment. So we'll be speaking about issues like due diligence regulation, transparency and accountability, and several other topics. So please do not hesitate at any point in the conversation to ask your questions, and we will try to answer them when that is possible and when that isn't. So if everything is clear, I would give the word to Friedel to start off um, on the first topic. Go ahead, Friedel. Thank you, Anthony. Can you can you change into the um, presentation? Oh, thank you. Well, first of all, like Anthony already announced, we will start with living income, but we will make um, this pretty short. Uh, from our point of view, um, the big step forward we had during the last years is that we have a clearer definition of um, how to calculate a living income. The anchor methodology is widely accepted, not only in the cocoa sector, but also other sectors, like for example, in the banana sector, they are now making calculations for all major producing countries. What we uh, did now for the first time is we tried to benchmark uh, cocoa production increases versus uh, in which country do that take place and what does that mean on uh, behalf of poverty. I will show you some figures afterwards. Um, we stressed once again that there's a close connection between living income and human rights due diligence because uh, poverty is uh, one of the causes of many human rights violations, including child labor. We acknowledge that this living income concept now, not only we have a definition, but only the, necess the necessity to achieve it is widely accepted in the cocoa sector. But what is not uh, so clear is how to get there. There are technical solutions, there are political solutions, there is a, a mix of it. And we are far from uh, defining um, clear responsibilities. We also stress once more that a living income is a starting point. Um, living income calculation is for bare minimum existence and um, nobody of us wants to live on the long run on the bare minimum. And most of us or perhaps all of us are not living on this. So um, what we are discussing now is that uh, we need a living income, but in the long run, we will need more. Um, Next slide, please. I already said that we have uh, a movement of cocoa into a poorer country. What we did for the cocoa barometer, we looked into uh, production 1990, 91, uh, 10 years later, another 10 years later nowadays. And one of the striking things is what you see in the two left columns that in 1990, 1991 season, uh, 40, nearly 55% of cocoa production was coming from um, Western Africa, global production was 2.5 million tons. Um, 30, 40 years later, uh, 30 years later, production nearly doubled. But now the share of uh, West African country is 74%. Uh, um, other countries, we had uh, different developments. Um, 
big decline of production in Brazil was uh, mostly caused at first by witches broom, but the striking thing is that after some of the problems were solved or in other regions of the countries, farmers did not go into cocoa anymore. Indonesia had a steep increase of cocoa production and afterwards in the last years, it's steep decline. So that production is nearly the same as um, uh, 30 years ago. The only two countries with major increases are Ecuador and Peru. But still, if you look into global production without West Africa, you see that it rose only from 1.1 million tons to 1.25 million tons, while in West Africa, uh, pro uh, production more than doubled. If you benchmark this with a human development index of a uh, United Nations development program, you will see that we had the steepest increase of cocoa production in Cote d'Ivoire, which has the lowest um, human development uh, indicator. The country is ranking 165 from 189 countries. So the poorest countries had the increase. And in general, with the exception of Peru and Ecuador with a massive government uh, money behind the increase and uh, their focus on finer flavor cocoa and uh, high yielding cocoa, um, this is the exception, but in all the other regions, the production went either down or didn't increase that fast as in West Africa. So cocoa is going into the poorest countries. Next slide, please. What we also see in the living income debate, and we repeated it over and over, uh, farmers have no influence on price. We had a discussion recently uh, where somebody said, but the market is functioning. Well, for farmers, the market was never functioning. Uh, nobody asked about their costs. Uh, the price is dictated by the world market, and this is a very unequal uh, distribution of risk. Um, many companies are still talking about uh, productivity increase to uh, improve net income of farmers. Uh, I will have some figures afterwards, but my question is, is there a net increase with increasing productivity? Is there available and affordable uh, input uh, on the market? Are there, uh, is, is labor affordable and available? Do we have enough data to, uh, for farmers to make decision based on business interests. We have an absence of success of scale. Uh, we have many pilots, but even after 20 years of productivity discussion, productivity, high productivity is still a niche. What also everybody knows is that if only 10% of the farmers would double productivity, the price would collapse. So um, this in itself cannot be the solution to achieve a living income alone. Diversification also runs in major problems. If farmers diversify into coffee, uh, rubber or palm oil, they run into the same problems like they have in the cocoa sector. And therefore we stress once again in the cocoa barometer that price is still a crucial factor. Not the only, but crucial. When we try to calculate um, what price is necessary to achieve a living income and how much farmers can produce with their labor and their land, we run still into major problems. You know that, um, or some of you may know that uh, two years ago, I made a huge Excel file with um, data from more than 20 studies. And according to these papers, um, land, diff, uh, average land size of farmers is significantly higher than that, what you see here. These figures here, these lines you see, they are from the questionnaire on the cocoa barometer. They are not weighted, um, so uh, not weight. So I get information from companies without a base, but you see here that on average, the company report only 2.1 hectare of available cocoa land for Ghana, which is significantly lower than in the studies I compiled two or three years ago, based on what farmers told researchers. Farm size in Cote d'Ivoire, GPS and polygon measures also seems to be significantly lower on average when what you find in the studies. On Cameroon and Nigeria, you see only very few data as um, there's not so much measurement taking place. But this, was an, this is an important point um, if we talk about 
production increases, not only productivity, but uh, general production per farm, that farm sizes might be much smaller than we expected before. If you look into yield, in most uh, papers you find that the average yield in West Africa is roughly 400 kilo, or according to the, the kit figures, even perhaps below, at least uh, um, in many regions. Um, here, these are compiled figures of uh, a lot of companies. And you see that the average here with uh, nearly 550 kilo for Cote d'Ivoire and 500 kilo for Ghana is significantly higher than what was reported in all the studies, mostly it's my impression due to the fact that farm sizes are now recalculated and if farm sizes are smaller than expected, but uh, farmers still know their harvest, the average yield per hectare must be higher when, than what was said before. You also see the spread in this. We have much less figures on um, labor days per hectare, also a crucial factor to calculate a living income. The spread here shows how many problems we still have, um, specifically for good agricultural practices. One company told me it's 46 days per hectare per year, and another company told me they have tested it in Ghana and it's 211 days. So what is the truth? I don't know. But um, as long as we do not know this, we have no real base to calculate how much land a farmer could work on and how much he, he could harvest. If it's 211 days a farmer with two hectare and good agricultural practices is already working a full-time job together with his wife. Next slide, please. Now, Anthony takes over. Before we do that, we want to leave open for ah, um, questions for questions and answers on this topic. So um, we will uh, we will allow for questions and answers now, specifically on the living income aspect. Just to add a little bit to the point that Friedel brought in, specifically around farm size and uh, average yields, the the effect that better data has on assumptions is significant. If you actually know that farm sizes are smaller and productivity is already higher, what does that do with the assumptions within sustainability programs that it is easy to increase the yield of cocoa farmers? So how does that influence where we are going for the future on that level? but also the questions and concerns we have around the availability of labor and the availability of inputs means that we have some very strong concerns around whether or not productivity increase can be the, the, the cornerstone of a sustainability program. That doesn't mean that we think that farmers should not professionalize and should not increase their um, productivity. We think that that is part of a way forward, but it cannot be the key building block as it is currently for every sustainability program. We would like to allow for questions at this point. So if there are questions in here, please do not refrain from putting them in the chat and we will try to answer them where possible. We've got about 10, 15 minutes for Q&A on this one and then we will move on to the topic of uh, human rights and child labor. So Stephanie Daniels from the um, uh, Sustainable Food Lab in the United States asks, could we expand on whether VOICE has aligned with Fairtrade International living income reference price calculations? Um, uh, good question, Stephanie. Um, we released a paper earlier this year in January, February, where we outlined some of the concerns around the living income reference price calculations that are there. And I think first and foremost, it's important to say that it's only recently that it has been possible to come up with calculations around what we think a fair price should be. And the reason for that is because pricing is very dependent on a lot of variables. And if there's not sufficient data available on those variables, then at, both, at best you're making um, guesses and estimates at what it should be. By now, because there is more data available around productivity, around cost of production, around farm size, household size, 
Um, and because there are now numbers, there are benchmarks on what a living income benchmark should be for a household. And there are also benchmarks on what households are earning. Finally, there is becoming slowly enough data to make these calculations. These are still incomplete calculations. And I think specifically cost of production data is very missing. And the point that Friedel was making around how much extra days does it cost to implement good agricultural practices become makes it a very complex issue. Now, this is where our perspective definitely differs from the fair trade perspective at the moment. And the main issue there is that fair trades calculations aim to pay a living income to farmers at Farmgate, provided a farmer increases its productivity to 800 kilos per hectare. And as Friedel said, if even just 10% of farmers would do that, we would see a price collapse across the board because of oversupply. So we don't think that making a fair price dependent on farmers almost doubling their productivity. We don't think that that's a sustainable way forward. We think actually that should be the other way around. Let's first make sure farmers earn a living income and then let's show that they can increase their productivity. And if they can, well, then we can reduce the price again. I think that should be the chronology of it, not let them prove that they can raise their productivity before we raise prices. I think that really shouldn't be the, the, uh, the order of things. Friedel, do you have something to add here? Yeah. Um, yeah, this is, this is our discussion with Fairtrade and with, uh, with others. Um, they have so many unknown factors in their calculation. Like, for example, Fairtrade, they calculate with 125 days, I think, per hectare per year. If the 211 are true, which come from a major company, uh, we have a complete different picture. Um, if you would add up uh, 100 labor days uh, to increase productivity by, let's say, even 500 kilo, and you would have to pay for 100 labor days, um, the uh, living wage, which was calculated in Ghana for the banana sector, but it will be similar in the cocoa sector, 100 labor days would cost you more than 1,000 US dollar. So if you take the present price for cocoa and you add 1,000 US dollar for uh, extra, but you get much less for your cocoa, it is no business case to improve productivity. We still don't know. There is also a question about the cost of production. No, we don't have enough data on uh, uh, on cost of production for various regions. Um, even the data we use in the cocoa barometer were only given to us uh, in an aggregated way. Uh, companies are collecting a lot of data, but they are not publicly sharing them to, um, to draw your own conclusions. And this is also in itself disastrous. If you have a farmer in Ghana who thinks he has three hectare and you give him a credit to buy fertilizer and pesticides and he buys these inputs for three hectares, but in reality, he has only two hectare. He will use too much fertilizer and too much pesticides. He will poison nature and perhaps um, even the consumers of a chocolate because he does not know how big his farm is. So these data, they have not only to be measured by companies, they have to be shared with farmer organizations, with farmers to perhaps even produce production costs if farmers know more about the size of their farm. Uh, will it in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, will it close the gap? No. The calculation uh, made on a living income uh, made by the kit, it was based on the old prices before the price collapse. Now, the price the, even with the lit in Cote d'Ivoire is still lower than it was when uh, the kit made their study. The price until March 2017 was 1,100 CFA. We are now back to 1,000. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, the lit will not close the living income gap, by far not. I think it's important to add there, though, that the fact that the Ivorian and Ghanaian government have teamed up to increase the farm gate prices is a very important development, something that we have also been um, calling on the producer governments to do for more than a decade now. So on the one hand, we are very glad to see that these mov movements are happening. Um, 
but calling it a living income differential when the calculation is not based on actually getting farmers to a living income is quite complex from a marketing or from a messaging perspective because um, um, in our calculations, the farm gate price should be probably above $3,000 um, per ton. And um, that is nowhere near the current number, which is closer to $1,600, $1,700. So probably, you know, we need to see a significant increase at farm gate level um, in order to, to, to close the living income gap. And so we think that probably this living income differential Looking forward, um, we strongly hope the Ivorian and Ghanaian government continue with this policy, but that it actually starts being adapted to what farmers really need to earn in order to get to a living income. So, um, and that, that brings us to the last question that I see here, which is a question from Baukiteus from, uh, from Solidaridad, what are our recommendations? And I think the key recommendations are around living income is to make sure that we've got holistic policies in place that look at all of the variables to increase farmer income. And that means looking at the challenges around increasing productivity, so availability of labor, availability of inputs, the effects that will have on um, uh, the world market price and overproduction, um, looking at diversification and the challenges that are part of that, but at the same time, making sure that prices are right. And there's a really important role for producer governments in pushing uh, the prices up the way they have through the living income differential. But there is also a very important role for companies um, uh, on that, particularly in the medium to short term, because to be very honest, it it isn't rocket science, and this is something that we have been saying for a very long time now, but if cocoa and chocolate companies really care about the poverty of cocoa farmers, the first thing they can do in order, the first step they can take in order to do something about the poor farmers is to give more money and to pay a higher price at farm gate level. And there is not a single reason why an individual company should not be able to do that. And I think one of the main differences that we have seen in the last two years is because of this living income differential, it is a lot more possible to talk about what farm gate prices should be. So that really is a positive development that we are talking about it. The problem is, there's not a lot of things being done about it yet. We don't know of a single multinational that is actually coming anywhere near paying a, uh, a living income price at farm gate that, that would be sufficient. And, um, and, and we feel that that really is one of the easiest next steps that, uh, the, uh, that the companies can take. There's one more question from, from Nick uh, who asked mm -hmm. um, that income increases in some areas might even uh, um, increase the number of working children. Well, already some 15 years ago or something, I wrote a, a study on child labor in India and this phenomenon was known there also that under certain circumstances, um, the number of working children might increase. Uh, but what also, the study from ICI in Swissco says that this is only in very rare occasions and um, that usually um, child labor decreases if income rises. This is a phenomenon which was also uh, seen here in Europe. And the question is, how much does it rise, the income? Um, that was also a problem in some, some Indian regions. If there is a low rise of income and farmers, for example, buy more sheep and goat, there is a risk that more children go to look after the animals. But the moment he can hire somebody to do it, the children go to school. And this is also uh, the point here from my point of view, and I haven't seen any other research uh, research in the cocoa sector. If uh, cocoa becomes more lucrative, yes, there is a risk that farmers concentrate more on cocoa. But we also know the, the studies where parents in uh, West Africa say that they want, the children, they want their children in school. So the moment they can afford adult labor um, and pay adult labor enough money so that cocoa, working on cocoa farms becomes attractive again, um, we will be, um, I think there will be not that risk. Vice versa, we know definitely that decreasing incomes always increases the risk of child labor. 
I think that's a, a really good bridge to the next part where we want to talk specifically about human rights. And I've seen that those slides have fallen out of our PowerPoint presentation, but we can do this without the slides per se. Um, when we look at child labor and a lot of the other human rights issues, they are driven to a large extent by poverty. And so therefore they require poverty alleviation measures to deal with them. Whilst at the same time, you won't solve the human rights issues if you only look at it from a poverty lens. So um, it's a conditio sine qua non to, to solve poverty if you want to really work on child labor and other human rights issues, but it also requires additional interventions on those specific issues. And as far as that goes, I think we're seeing an, a very interesting conversation in the cocoa sector where both prevention and remediation are becoming key elements of the conversation um, where we, are concerned about the fact that it seems like quite a few actors are starting to see it as an either or conversation. Either you focus on prevention or you focus on remediation. And we really do need to see both happening at the same time. I think one of the key lessons learned obviously is, is that the promises made by the sector over the past two decades have not been met, especially when it comes to child labor. Um, and I think the recent NORC report, uh, University of Chicago on child labor has been a very sobering wake up call once again, that we are nowhere near where we need to be with child labor, which is also why one of the key recommendations in the whole cocoa barometer, as it was in the cocoa barometer before this, as it was in the cocoa barometer before that, that we need to move beyond voluntary steps. And these, these, these voluntary commitments done by, um, by the sector will not be sufficient. They need to become mandatory. And so having a due diligence regulation that makes human rights compliance mandatory really will be one of the major steps forward. Um, we think that on the, on the remediation level, child labor monitoring and remediation systems are one of the better practices that we have seen. However, with the explosion of various companies using different approaches and calling it the same term, it is creating quite a, um, a lack of clarity in language. And we have found that in our questionnaires for the COCA barometer, we got a lot of very differing answers to whether or not companies are rolling out child labor monitoring remediation systems and the quality of the ability to be able to answer their effectiveness and their reach has been quite differing. And so we are quite concerned about the lack of uniformity in using languages there. And I think that that definitely on human rights will be an important way forward is to making sure that there becomes more and more alignment there. I think at the same time, it's also important to underline the role of the producer countries in the um, in the area of child labor specifically, um, where we're talking about the access to education, um, where we're talking about awareness raising and rule of law. And I think that specifically is also these three elements, you really start getting there when you start talking about the prevention aspects rather than the remediation aspects. But within that context, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights are paramount, where you see the state's duty to respect or to protect human rights. And then the corporation's responsibility to respect human rights really go hand in hand. And I think that the cocoa sector at, at the moment is sometimes running the risk of forgetting the fact that both of these guiding principles really both need to be upheld quite strongly. And then on the human rights, one or two last points that are key in this conversation are around gender inequality. We still feel, and the, the, the data and the research shows that there is a, a shocking gap still, despite a decade of talking about this, of women specific interventions, which leads to a whole bunch of different problems. If you, if, if you don't target your intervention specifically to be able to include women, in societies where women are excluded, this means they don't come along, whether that is in farmer training systems, whether that is access to inputs, or whether that is access to uh, a whole bunch of interventions that are available to most male heads of household. These interventions are often not available to women, whereas women do a lot of the work. Um, that's a practical aspect of it. There is also a human rights aspect that gender inequality from a rights-based approach is something that must be addressed. And then lastly, there's also an effectiveness aspect of gender equality and that shows that if you, if you don't train, if you don't bring women along 
in your interventions, you will be a lot less effective as well. Women's, um, uh, women's programs to raise levels of income tend to have a much stronger effect on household income than if you uh, increase the, the income for men. Um, it, they tend to have a whole bunch of other much stronger um, interventions on both human rights and socioeconomic aspects. And so gender inclusion in all programs should be a key building block for every um, every design system uh, as far as sustainability is concerned. And then we need to talk about the inclusion of farmers and cooperatives in the conversation as well and labor rights that are often also underrepresented in the conversation. And specifically also looking at tenants and sharecroppers who what we feel the living income conversation, a lot of these calculations, a lot of the conversation is around farm owners but we know that a very large percentage of people working the fields in Coco, in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana in Coco are sharecroppers, our tenants are working under various systems where they do not get the full income from the farms. What are the interventions that we are going to roll out there? And so I think those are real key issues on human rights looking forward. Friedel, what do you have to add to this? You are muted, Friedel. Yes, I saw. Sorry, um, I have not much to add. There is this ongoing debate on on, on laws, on uh, legislation, on the EU level, but also in, uh, in quite a few important cocoa-consuming countries, and um, we will be mounting pressure on the industry um, to make their value chains more transparent and to avoid. Uh, human rights uh, violations in the value chain. Uh, this will be a factor in the next years and um, this should lead to more common work on the problems, sharing data, sharing information and uh, learning from each other instead of competition on it. Thank you, Friedel. Um, are there questions in the audience on this? We would like to, I, I do apologize that we can't have a backwards and forwards in speaking and hearing your voices. That often is a much more natural way of doing things. However, our um, conference infrastructure does not allow for that. But if there are questions, comments, observations around the aspect of human rights, child labor, gender equality, farmer organization, this would be the moment to bring that up. If you have something to add, you could also raise your hand. That is also an option here. And then um, I will know that there are questions. Are there any hands raised or not? I do not see any hands raised. That means that we can probably make good a little bit of time and start talking about the next key component of the barometer, which is where we're starting to talk about the more environmental aspect of things, which is where we do find our PowerPoint again. So I shall start sharing my screen there. There we go. That should be this one. Um, I'm assuming that this is once again visible for everybody. Um, Friedel, I can see your face. Can you confirm that you can see my PowerPoint now? Yes. Yes. Great. So when we look at the, historically speaking, the cocoa sector over the last two decades started talking mostly about child labor. And at some point we started incorporating the conversation around farmer poverty and living income more and more. Over the past four or five years, um, environmental protection has become a much more important part of the conversation again. And you will see that this cocoa barometer spends a lot more time looking at the environmental aspect of cocoa production. And we can largely um, categorize that into three major buckets, deforestation, agroforestry, and agrochemicals. Um, Firstly, when we look at deforestation, I think if you look at the impact of deforestation, obviously the first thing that we look at is the loss of biodiversity, loss of habitat. You know, 85% of West Africa's rainforest has been lost 
to deforestation, much of that driven by um, uh, by cocoa production over the past several decades. Um, a lot of habitat is missing in West Africa, but this is a problem that is a lot more global in scope than the child labor issue, because this is a topic that we see come in every region where cocoa is grown, whether that is West Africa, whether that is the, um, the Congo Basin in Central Africa, whether we're talking about the Amazon Basin and rainforests in Colombia, or whether we're talking about the, uh, the rainforests in Southeast Asia. Deforestation is a global issue for the cocoa sector not just because of the loss of habitat, but I think that especially this year uh, has become quite clear that the spread of, of lethal pathogens for humans is also definitely a very real result of our interaction with deforestation. Um, uh, and then the third main reason why deforestation is something that has such impact on our lives is because of the climatological effects. Um, two key components of that, first and foremost, the loss of carbon storage. Rainforests, original growth rainforests, are tremendous storage uh, spaces for CO2 um, that we just simply cannot replicate in artificial agricultural systems. Um, but also because rainforests, well, the name says it already, they're rainforests. They are, they are literal rain machines. And if you cut down the rainforest, you're basically breaking down the rain machines. And that's something that we see very clearly happening in West Africa with, with, with a strongly destabilized microclimate over the past several decades, vastly influencing rainfall patterns and moisture, making certain parts of West Africa much less suitable for cocoa production as well. So this, it's also a, a self a uh, strengthening cycle um, within cocoa deforestation is made for cocoa is making it less applicable, making the country less um, amenable to cocoa production. So we've got a big issue there on deforestation. Let's see, how can I go to the next slide? Now, there are several things that need to happen to start mitigating deforestation and aspects that we still really seem to be missing in the cocoa sector at the moment. First and foremost, we're talking about traceability. If you can't measure what's being deforested, then it's very hard to start putting in place um, um, remediation systems. And as far as that goes, it is very disappointing that the national traceability and monitoring systems that were announced within the Cocoa and Forests Initiative upon their launch three years ago have um, at present still not been rolled out. Um, and though some major steps are being taken at traceability at individual company level, I think the past few months have seen several companies disclosing where they are getting their cocoa from at the very least to co-op level and some to farm level. Um, and those are important steps forward and we would like to continue to stimulate companies to do so. It is disappointing that this is happening at a very individual level and we're not seeing the collective rollout and the alignment and the um, compatibility of these traceability systems the way that we should see them. And it's quite interesting to see that the biggest step forward around traceability of deforestation was a move by um, Mighty Earth, an NGO, pushing forward a traceability and accountability map, rather than this being a move from a collective sector-wide initiative that promised to start doing these things. So there's, there's quite a bit of homework to be caught up on traceability. Now, the thing is, it brings us to the next point around reforestation and restoration of degraded areas. Um, so much rainforest has already been cut down, specifically in West Africa, that we really need to look at ways how to mitigate some of the major impacts of deforestation there. Um, and we think that agroforestry and specifically diverse agroforestry systems are going to be a very important part of that. More on that in a little while. And then lastly, around the mitigation of deforestation, there's one major concern that we do feel must be brought up, and that is that forest protection must be coupled with protection of human rights. Um, and we have seen an increasing amount of, increasing amounts, not, we have seen very regular reports of communities being evicted with violence and or other human rights being abused in an attempt to protect the environment. And we believe that there is a tension there, a, um, uh, an inherent tension that does need to be 
carefully monitored and protecting the environment cannot come at the expense of breaking and abusing human rights. And so I think there's a very important role for all of us to play there in, in, in keeping a careful eye on that moving forward. Now, I mentioned agroforestry as a mitigation response. Agroforestry is going to be very important. However, we have some problems with agroforestry. And the first is what is agroforestry? We have done a questionnaire for the barometer and literally every single company we sent a questionnaire to came with a different definition of what is your definition of agroforestry? Um, I mean, strictly speaking, every um, agricultural system where you use more than one crop of which one is a tree is agroforestry already. Um, but that could basically mean that you've got a kind of a, 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 a full, full sun monoculture crop of agroforestry, which is one tree and one shrub uh, system um, and call it agroforestry. And so I think we really need to work towards uh, much better definitions on what we're talking about when we're talking about agroforestry, um, which is also why, because there's such a wide variety and a low threshold, a low bar for agroforestry, we're seeing a very low impact of current efforts. We're seeing very low tree survival rates and also very low adoption rates where agroforestry is rolled out. And we're seeing it used as an excuse to replace heavily forested areas with agroforestry. And I think this is really very important to mention. Agroforestry should never replace original growth rainforests. And agroforestry also should never, or a simple agroforestry system should never replace a complex agroforestry system that is already in play. In fact, we should actually go to the point where all cocoa should be grown under what we call diverse agroforestry systems. So those are complex agroforestry systems with many different tree varieties. And if you are now working in a full sun monoculture system, you should be working towards more diverse agroforestry systems. And that should be the direction it should go. And then agroforestry is not a zero deforestation commitment. Those two are often mixed up, but it's really important that we start seeing how agroforestry can work with no deforestation and reforestation programs, but they are not the same as. That is where we talk about deforestation and agroforestry. I'm going to hand over to Friedel now for um, the topics around agrochemicals. Friedel. Yeah, but let me let me add one point to the agroforestry. Um, this was a really a problem throughout the whole uh, questionnaire. Uh, you have one company which you ask how much of your cocoa comes from agroforestry and they tell you, I don't know, 2000 hectare of a pilot and the next one says, well, 80% because 80% comes from a certified area. Um, data were not comparable and uh, targets were not comparable. If you go to higher productivity, we often talk about uh, agrochemicals and I start here with fertilizers and pesticides uh, is the next point. There's very old research um, which says that tailored fertilizers are necessary. In Kutiva research already in 1975 looked at the soils in the different cocoa producing regions and they identified 26 different formula of fertilizer which are necessary. On the market, I think are two or three different. I don't remember exactly, but you will find it in the barometer. So the average farmer, uh, there's, a, there's a high risk that a farmer, the average farmer buys a fertilizer, which he should, should not use on his or her soil presently. But these are the only ones on the market. In Ghana, a study concluded that there are at least 30 different formulas needed. And also uh, in Ghana, you have a lot of one size fits at all solutions. So uh, you, need, you, you put components in your fertilizers, which your soil does not need, which might even damage your trees. Improper use of fertilizer is very widespread because there is noise, no uh, soil quality testing on most, most, most of the farms, different to some farms in uh, Latin America. There's not enough training for farmers and uh, tailored fertilizers are necessary, but not available. 
organic fertilizer in agroforestry are a potential alternative. And I found some, uh, some studies about uh, chicken manure, for example, with, uh, uh, which increased pro productivity significantly. But um, again, um, or other companies who now uh, teach farmers to produce uh, organic fertilizer, that was in Latin America. But again, here, um, we don't need enough to, to make, uh, to propagate good solutions and to train farmers on this. Pesticide, a wide vari uh, variety of pesticides is presently used to control all the different pests and diseases in the cocoa sector, even highly disputed ones, um, which kills uh, a lot of, which kill a lot of insects. And at the same time, uh, you have poll hand pollination uh, systems uh, introduced in Ghana, because I think the most probably reason for this is that you killed so many insecticides that the pollination is not working properly anymore. So. Oh, I have here improper use of fertilizer is widespread. I copied and pasted, of course, improper use of pesticide is widespread. The reasons are very similar. Um, lack of knowledge, not no or insufficient uh, protection when you bring out the pesticides, eating and drinking during the application of pesticides. Uh, storage close to food or uh, near to underage children are very common. So pesticides comes with a lot of risk and they're still strongly propagated to increase productivity due to the high productivity losses we have presently uh, caused by pests and diseases. There's an increase of children using pesticides. Um, this shows the NORC study. Um, again here, organic production and agroforestry are an alternative, but uh, we need much more research on this. All in all, um, you have also the problem that most of the fertilizers and pesticides are imported, which uh, comes at high cost for the hard currency balance of the countries. The only West African country which produces uh, fertilizer is Nigeria, but even they import most of it. Um, during the price collapse, 16, 17, even companies advised farmers not to invest into fertilizers. And that was also a huge problem in my research. I found no publicly available study uh, how to mitigate this price risk if a cocoa price falls or the harvest is low due to bad climate or something. So um, I found no paper which really proves that farmers earn significantly more if they use as a net income, if they use a lot of um, agrochemicals. Um, other environment concerns we, we mention in the, in the cocoa barometer are of course uh, gold searches, galamsai are they called in, uh, in Ghana which uh, destroy huge areas. We have logging and uh, tree tenure systems, which are not transparent uh, and don't encourage farmers uh, to have more shadow trees. Um, the climate change was already mentioned, but we also have a lot of problems with soil degradation. Um, we have the problem with older plantations that the soils are degraded. We don't have in many areas, it seems like we the fertilizers, we need to fight this and we don't have um, the agroforestry systems which could uh, mitigate these damages. Yes, thank you, Friedel. Um, we've got several questions that have come in and I saw that Andrew Brooks raised his hand. Um, Andrew, would you be willing to also put your question in the chat while I answer while we answer the two previous questions so that we can also see what your position was? That would be great to have. So if you could send your question, that would be good. Um, there's a question from Marco Guilcatbi. Uh, if we could talk about what are the principal schemes of compensation when you have deforestation? Um, I'm assuming I'm trying to figure out who would be compensated. Do we compensate the governments? Do we compensate the farmers? I think part of the problem is, is that the biggest problem in deforestation is farmer poverty. One of the main reasons why farmers go into um, 
previously forested areas is because they are poor and they don't often see other alternatives. And so therefore, um, it is going to be important to make sure that we come up with, and we'll talk about that a little bit in the last session after this, where we're talking about the more kind of systems-based approaches where we are going to have to find holistic approaches, looking at full landscape systems where farmers get to earn a decent livelihood within a concept of a holistic framework that looks at supply management, that looks at making sure we're not overproducing, that looks at making sure we protect environment, but that will require extra income for farmers. And the problem is, is you can't just ask them to start growing other products because the other products that they could sell are also poverty products. It's not as if a cocoa farmer, if he starts growing coffee or palm oil or soy or rubber, all of a sudden starts earning a lot more money. They're stuck in kind of the competitive crops are equally as bad as badly paying crops as cocoa and so there's a real there's a real challenge and a problem to solve across the board there um so um so there's there's a challenge there's a challenge clearly around compensating farming there there is a conversation taking place around the payment for environmental services so trying to find ways to pay farmers to leave existing trees there um, if you want that to work properly then you are going to have to strongly strengthen your land and tree tenure security in country as well and though Ghana has started working on the ability of farmers to register the existing trees that they still have on their land, um, that still is a highly bureaucratic process and that hasn't been rolled out universally across the land yet. So there's some major challenges there. And in Cote d'Ivoire, we've even got a bigger problem that you're not allowed to own the land if there's issues around migration involved, which there often are. And so there's, there's some real issues around land and tree tenure that need to be solved if we want to be able to solve the payment for environmental service system as well. And, and one of my main concerns is that both payment for environmental services as well as carbon stockage systems that might be able to provide payment might become something that solves some of the problems for the multinationals. But the big question is, is will it solve the problem for the farmers again? Because if it doesn't solve the problem for the farmers, it won't solve the problem of deforestation. Because in the end, if there is a market for farmers to be able to go into forested areas and to sell products that are grown there, then they will do so because of economic necessity. So um, there's an issue there. Um, I'm seeing, Andrew, your hand keeps being raised, but I'm not seeing the question. So if you're having trouble finding the chat function, you could also send me an email. I'm sure you have my email address. So Andrew Brooks, if you want to ask your question, you can also send me an email. That would be fine as well. Isabel from Solidaridad asks us, how do we think that the sector should address the issues we presented with agrochemicals? Do we see a role for agrochemical companies in dealing with these issues? Um, the problem with getting agrochemical companies to take responsibility there, it's a little bit like put, putting the fox in the hen house, isn't it? Because an agrochemical company will want to sell more agrochemicals. But some of the issues are clearly based on a lack of tailored approaches. And so putting in place tailored approaches might be part of the solution. Um, we are arguing that we think that organic and, and agroforestry approaches should be the first go-to on this. But if you must use agrochemicals, then do so through uh, an IPM, Integrated Pest Management System approach, make it tailored, and very much work through local communities in awareness raising specifically around um, exposing children to hazardous chemicals, as well as making sure that adults use it, are properly trained and have properly protective uh, um, equipment in order to ensure that they reduce their exposure. Friedel, you wanted to add to this as well. Yeah, what the chocolate and cocoa industry could do is uh, they could write a petition to the European Union uh, so that uh, they make a law which allows no longer the exports of chemicals which are banned in the EU for good reasons to cocoa producing countries. Um, there is a study by the Pesticide Action Network, which was made for uh, UTZ, which shows that many banned chemicals, which are banned in Europe, are used in the cocoa sector. And they are produced by uh, European companies, partly. 
Um, so um, it is in the interest of the cocoa and chocolate industry to, to stop this. Um, I, I mentioned already how ridiculous it is to start with hand pollination. Um, you have to, you have destroyed the natural systems, uh, the governments in Cotivar and Ghana still allow uh, pesticides which are banned for the damage they do um, to nature. Um, which are allowed to be used or which uh, for on the cocoa bot list, for example, I think we're still on it. There was one pesticide which is banned everywhere else, but they still allow to use it. Why? So beside the pressure on the EU, EU to stop um, export, there should be a pressure on the cocoa producing companies, uh, cocoa producing countries, governments uh, to stop the import of banned pesticides. There's a reason why they are banned. And, and, and those effects are both on the health and well-being of the farming population, as well as on the health and well-being of consumers There's and the health and well-being of the planet. So there's a, a triple bottom line there in making sure that we keep um, agrochemical use to an absolute minimum. Um, I'm going to move on. We're going to move on to the last topic, unless there are further questions around this. Um, obviously, there will be a lot more conversation around this in um, in the cocoa barometer um, as we go on. I think that um, uh, one of the things that we would like to already mention here is is that from January onwards, we are going to host a series of webinars on these specific topics, going into much deeper detail. Um, where we're also hoping to invite some of you as speakers and panelists and going into to, to, to quite decent conversation around uh, around these topics, because we believe that it's going to be essential for us to find platforms again to have these conversations. I'm glad the WCF is hosting this partnership meeting. Um, there are quite a few webinars that are being organized within the cocoa sector, but I'm not sure about you guys, but I'm starting to deeply miss the ability to share thoughts and ideas with each other rather than to just share positions. Um, there is a difference between those two. And I think that in the cocoa sector, we had built uh, uh, the capacity of sharing thoughts and ideas and, and thinking aloud together. And um, with this global lockdown, we are going to have to find other ways of being able to think out loud together rather than just uh, putting forward the perspectives that we already have. Um, I see two more questions that have come in, so we'll try to answer those before we go in. Did we also look at the profitability, the business case of agroforestry systems, as a recommendation for optimizing ecological and economic outcomes of smallholder cocoa farmers in sub-Saharan Africa? Um, yes, we have looked at it. We think that there are some um, very valuable and interesting positions there. I think Friedel is probably better suited at answering that question as he organized a whole conference on this topic a year and a half ago. Friedel, do you want to go into this a little bit? Um, examples from Latin America show that there's definitely a business case. Um, and uh, pilot projects of some companies also show that um, that it makes sense to invest into agroforestry. The problem is if you go into real agroforestry systems, meaning you need a lot of training for the farmers, you need a lot of plants, seedlings, um, you need access to markets, um, and farmers mostly often have to cut down at least a huge part of their old cocoa trees and replant and uh, plant them in between other um, trees and other varieties of fruits. Um, they need an upfront major investment. One of the figures mentioned from Cameroon last year was that they calculated that a farmer would need over three years time an investment capital of $6,000. A huge part of this is the income, which is not floating if you cut down part of your trees, others was uh, to buy things or to hire labor. And in the present poverty situation, uh, most, most of the farmers will not be able to invest in this. So yes, there might be a business case once you have it, but uh, there is presently no business case to start it. As there is no money to start it. I think some of the, the a question brought by Marco as well around the um, 
the ways of compensating deforestation free schemes saying if you want to deforest a hectare you need to also have reforested a hectare um there are a lot of different schemes that are currently being a lot of there are some schemes currently being piloted to see how environmental protection can become more remunerative for farmers and i think that you know we need to be willing to look at various um, experiments uh, for how to make that work. However, I think it's really important within that context to state unequivocally that once you have destroyed a hectare of old growth rainforest, it is virtually impossible to restore the incredible amount of what they call ecological services that such a hectare of rainforest brings, biodiversity, habitat preser preservation, but also the role that it has towards climatological preservation as well as carbon stockage. That is uncompensatable in man-made um, uh, regrowth strategies, at least not within a lifetime. And so, um, any system that tries to exchange deforestation with reforestation, they are not, you cannot compensate them one on one. It's like, it, it's as if you would give someone, you try to trade a paper clip for a Ferrari. Um, it just doesn't work. <laughs> they are there incomparable magnitudes. And so I think that you really have to watch out for that. Um, often we do try to find ways of we, you know, being able to, you know, when you book an airline flight, you try to compensate the CO2 um, emissions of your flight with planting a few trees. It, it, though some, on some levels, superficially, the mathematics might work out in the medium to long term, it really doesn't. And so we would urge caution on such schemes. Um, Friedel, and then we'll move on to the last. Uh, yeah, I, uh, there was one question about Galamsai, uh, but mm -hmm. before I come to this, I want to add something to what Anthony just said. One of the major issues uh, in uh, in Cotivar during the last decade was uh, that more and more even uh, natural, uh, protected nature reserves were cut down. And according to the estimates of the Ivorian government, a third of uh, cocoa production comes from these areas. It all finds its way into the market. When we sent the questionnaire to companies and ask how much of your cocoa can you trace to a cooperative or even farm level, many of them now can, they said that they usually can now trace the direct supply, which were buy directly, but there is a huge difference between the different companies, how much of the cocoa we use comes from direct supply. It could be only one third. So two thirds we just don't know. And others are nearer to, uh, to 100%, specifically smaller users. But there is still, I would estimate half of a harvest on the market without traceability. And as long as uh, you can, uh, cut down um, nature reserves, uh, grow cocoa and sell it, there is no incentive to stop this. Um, so um, the industry should make all cocoa traceable as soon as possible and ban as a first step illegally produced cocoa from the, sec from the market. If there is no market, there's no incentive to cut down trees anymore. But there's not much left in West Africa. One of the reasons why there is not so much left in some areas of Ghana are um, the Galamsai. They are active since centuries, but usually often even cocoa farmers, they do it in the lean season and they go to a river with very primitive equipment. What happened in the last decade was that specifically China's companies invested and now they, they can ruin a whole plantation with, within a few days with, uh, uh, with machinery. I've seen on the, on the airport in Ghana big signs in English and in Chinese, which explained uh, that it is prohibited to, to go uh, gold digging in the country. So there is a problem. The government tries to tackle it. But again, as long as people are poor, they will go for it. This is something you hear also from uh, from cocoa farmers that young people prefer to go uh, into the gold mines or illegal gold mining because there at least they have a chance 
to earn a decent money, which we don't often have at a cocoa farm. Uh, we're, going to, yeah. we're going to have to move on here yeah. um, to summarize. And I see some questions coming in here, whether there are good examples of things that have happened. Um, uh, we don't highlight specific examples in the barometer, but we do think it's important to start mapping those um, towards the future. Um, I, I think there's one last question from Cédric van Kutzen, Mondelez. How do we define illegal cocoa in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana? I think it's important to differentiate here. We're not just looking at illegal, but we're talking about all forms of deforestation. I think that one of the responses of producer governments in West Africa has sometimes been to legitimize previous deforestation. Um, whether or not it's legal, it still is a massive uh, degradation of uh, natural habitat. And so I think that we need to move beyond pure definitions of legality sometimes, specifically when we look at environmental protection and we need to move towards environmental protection on certain levels there. Um, and, uh, go ahead, Friedel. Yeah, but um, I define illegal uh, at first point, does it come from areas where legally no cocoa tree should grow? And if you would, only remove that cocoa from the market, cocoa prices would be significantly higher. I've seen internal calculations of some companies what that would mean for the cocoa sector. And um, we would be at a price which might be even higher when what we calculated as a living income. So illegal for me firsthand is, is it grown on areas where you legally are allowed to go cocoa trees or not? The second aspect is what uh, Anthony said, in some places, even what is legal might not be something which you should do. Having said that, we are going to move on because we need to round off this conversation. We are going to go into the last uh, part of the conversation. Everything we've talked about so far is largely technical in nature, where we're talking about specific topical issues where a lot of the attention has been at farm level. However, um, the only way we're going to solve the problem is if we look at the enabling environment. Most of the solutions the past two decades have been at farm level, the, thereby assuming that the problem is also at farm level, but really it isn't. The, far, the, the, the problem is at the level of the enabling environment. And we've identified four key areas that we think need approaches at a, at a much more enabling environment level. And the first um, approach on that is around mandatory frameworks. And we think that it really is high time for a due diligence framework. Now, interestingly enough, the last two years has seen a major shift within the cocoa sector where the whole cocoa sector now seems to be embracing the idea of a due diligence regulation, both on mandatory human rights as well as on environmental protection um, for a variety of reasons. We need a level playing field. No individual actor can actually do what is necessary to make their supply chain sustainable on their own. Because if they would do so, they would create um, they would create such a price incentive. They would they would block themselves out of the market, and everybody else would be able to undercut them. And so, the level playing field is a really important argument for that. Now, part of the conversation that the industry is doing in support of the mandatory due diligence regulation is, is that they need it at an EU level or at a global level rather than at a national level. Now, we believe that there is actually a large complementarity available between national and regional or EU due diligence regulations. They don't have to bite each other. And in fact, they can help each other move forward. So we believe that have, actually having different speeds happening at the same time can be quite useful. Within this context, though, we need to say that they all must be based on the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights, outlining the six key steps that are in the OECD due diligence guidance. Um, we can go into detail on that, but I don't think we have time in this call, but there's sufficient ample documentation and we go in depth in this in the COCA barometer, what a due diligence regulation should look like. Part of due diligence means there needs to be remediation, which means that for victims of abuses, whether that is a human rights abuse and or if your environment is being uh, degraded, there needs to be a possibility for remediation. So victims must have the ability to stop the transgression that is taking place. And there should be a liability at a corporate level for what's going on. Um, 
Does that mean there need to be fines or prison sentences? I'm not sure about that, but it does mean there need to be consequences that are proportionate and dissuasive at a corporate level if you transgress your due diligence requirement regularly or even at a, at a willful or unwillful base. Now, the most important point around due diligence is it does not allow you, if you find a problem, to say our solution to the problem is we're going to source elsewhere. Due diligence means if you find a problem, whether your farmers are poor, whether your farm is in child labor, whether you're degrading the environment, it doesn't matter which problem you find. If you find a problem, your first solution needs to be, how do I solve this for the people whose rights are being transgressed? rather than how do I solve this for my supply chain? I think that's a really important concept within due diligence that we hope will land very quickly because it is a key issue in why we think due diligence is a solution or part of a solution is it requires companies to actually work towards solving the problem where the problems are created, not just cleaning your supply chain and kicking out the poor people or leaving um, where you are sourcing from. So that's one of the four mandatory approaches that is necessary uh, for the four enabling environment approaches that is necessary. This one on the mandatory approach. The second enabling environment that is very necessary is a holistic approach. We need to look at these problems from a landscape, from a regional level. We cannot just look at this from a farm-based perspective. You cannot protect forests just by looking at the farm plots. You cannot solve poverty just by looking at an individual farmer. You cannot solve child labor just by looking at an individual farm. You need to look at what is happening at the broader level. When we're talking about cocoa prices, when we're talking about poverty, when we're talking about deforestation, that includes interventions around supply and demand. That includes um, interventions around agricultural policy at a national level in cocoa producer and governments. It also requires looking at cross commodity aspects. If all of the other crops in your region are also poverty traps, then it's not just going to help making cocoa attractive because then you'll draw the farmers into cocoa. You need to look at how do you develop this across the board. And these landscape level roadmaps need to be developed at a local level with time bound deliverables. So it's not just a free for all voluntary, oh, let's all see what we can do, but time bound deliverables. And this is what we're going to do, including work on land and forest governance, including work on rule of law, including work on rural infrastructure, and including, including traceability and monitoring systems. That's the second enabling environment approach that is necessary. The third enabling environment of, uh, approach that is necessary is one that looks at this from the bottom up perspective. How do you include farmers, civil society, and local communities. Currently, the cocoa sector has approached many of their problems from a very top-down approach. And we really need to switch that around. Farmers and local CSOs need to be involved, not just at the end, not just in a fun consultation where you can, just, where you can provide your input, but as key decision, co-decision makers within these designs. Now, when you set up a deliberative and inclusive approach, it does, it can, and it should be based on a global minimum threshold criteria. So when we're talking about human rights, you can be looking at ILO core criteria or the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or the Declaration on the Rights of the Child, et cetera, et cetera. When you're looking at environmental aspects, you can look at key minimum requirements as well, but they need to be translated to the local needs and the local context. You can't just top down put a global idea of this is what we think is right. It needs to translate to the local environment. And the only way you can do that correctly with ownership and understanding local context is by putting farmers and local civil society as co-decision makers at the table. These processes will take time. These are not quick and easy solutions where we're gonna have this solved before the next cocoa barometer comes out. These things take time and patience and they might require several restarts and they might require several problems before we get there. And through this all, we need to make sure that the interventions are tailored to such an extent that women have a full say at the table. And it also means that we need to have farmer empowerment, cooperatives that are strong and functioning at, as part of this conversation as well. 
So that is the third enabling environment that is necessary. They need to be uh, um, mandatory, they need to be holistic, they need to be bottom up, and lastly, they need to be transparent and accountable. There are too many pieces of information that are hidden from daylight, meaning that we cannot actually come to proper collective decisions, that we cannot come to proper collective processes, simply because they are in the dark. When we are talking about corporate reporting, whether we are talking about public services and resources at government level, whether we're talking about monitoring and traceability of the supply chain, or where we're talking about shared data around the issues that we're talking about, because shared data is something, despite us releasing these barometers for a decade and us talking for a decade to companies saying, give us more data, the data still is not sufficiently out there. So there are four enabling environments that really must be further rolled out. Mandatory, holistic, bottom up, and transparent and accountable enabling environment is necessary in order to move this conversation forward. Friedel, do you have anything to add before we go into the questions? No. I would then like to leave us open for the last 10 minutes of this for the questions to be brought in. As I have said before, and whilst you are typing in your questions, I will do a little bit of a sales pitch. We are going to go into these four topics in extreme depth where we can um, in January and February. Also, we will release the full barometer and the document. I saw a question from Andrianne. Um, whether the full document is already available online. We are looking, we are planning a release in two weeks time. I'm sorry that we just didn't make the deadline for this, but we are very close to publication. Um, um, once the document will be out there, obviously we are available for conversations and questions with any actors that are interested in this. We will have in-depth um, uh, workshops from January and February onwards. Um, and the document this time, as opposed to the previous barometers, will be a largely online publication. Um, we're not planning to have a lot of um, hard copies available, for, though for those of you that are dinosaurs like myself and would still prefer to have a piece of paper in their hand, we will have them available for you. Um, but um, also with the current lockdown, there's not a lot of places where we get to hand distribute them anyway, so uh, online is the way forward. Um, I see a question from Joaquim Munoz. Um, can we name any successful landscape projects for the cocoa sector? I think we're still waiting for first real results around the cocoa sector landscapes. Um, I think that what we're trying to advocate here are we're, we're identifying gaps where they are currently not taking place in the cocoa sector at the very least. But the whole idea of a landscape approach is, is that we look beyond a single commodity and that you look at what happens within the broader region as well. And so um, there are some real challenges ahead there. Um, Friedel, you look like you want to add something to this? Mm, yes and no. I mean, some of the companies, they, they are uh, innovative. Like uh, two or three years ago, I visited a cocoa, uh, big cocoa buyer in Ghana, and they told me that in one region, they supported farmer to grow cassava, cassava fruits, which uh, cassava varieties, which are um, seek for looked for in, in in nigeria the biggest cassava importer of the world so as a cocoa company we started to support the production and export of cassava this is something i would call a landscape approach but presently um, many sectors are talking about landscapes but even within companies uh, there are problems with the different departments I was in one discussion in Germany with two big retailers and we talked about a landscape approach in Cote d'Ivoire with cocoa, coffee, uh, pineapple, perhaps mango coming from the same region or banana. Um, and then uh, every, everybody was excited. We could do it in, in a landscape and we could uh, reorganize the sectors there. And then I asked uh, the people from the retailer, you have a cocoa buyer from your retailer, would you, would you also buy banana or pineapple from this region? And they said, oh, no, no, that's a different department and they work with Latin America. Uh, so we need not only the idea, we need a rethinking of buying practices of retailers, of uh, multinationals and so on. 
uh, it's nice to talk about a landscape, but um, we need uh, a different business approach for it. I see a question around the cadmium legislation for Latin American producers. Um, the cadmium regulation is a complex one and perhaps not best suited for this specific conversation. I have to say um, there are regulations in the EU taking place that will actually also affect West African cocoa producing uh, uh, specifically on the organic level. Um, I find it hard to know exactly what to say there. I think on cadmium level, I mean, the consumer protection is an important part of the conversation. Um, I'm also not an expert on what the levels are there uh, um, and cadmium obviously being inherent in the soil in many of the cocoa producing areas in Latin America has made this very complex. So um, I'm afraid that this is not the right moment to, to bring forward this, this, this point. I wish we, we could. I have also just been told by the organizers that we are running out of time and the way they are doing this for these conferences is they will shut down this session in in three and a half minutes. And so there are a few, and, and this will happen, they will push a button and the session will be finished. Um, so there are a few um, announcements from housekeeping level uh, to be done by Buddy. I want to thank you all for your time. I'm sure that Friedel does as well. Um, please yes. do stay in touch if you have questions. If you are not on our mailing list yet, go to voicenetwork.eu, sign up for a mailing list and we will send you the barometer when it comes out. Um, and we will send you an invite for our official launch webinar then as well, voicenetwork.eu. Thank you all very much. And do stick around for the housekeeping announcements. And we might see you later on this week at the rest of the partnership meetings. Thank you and goodbye. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you very much, Anthony and Fridol, for that great, very insightful and educational presentation on the key findings of the 20. 20 cocoa barometer. Uh, I'm sure that others as well as I uh, will be on the edge of our seats waiting for that to come out and we hope to hear more information about those webinars that you mentioned starting in January. This concludes our first session of the 2020 World Cocoa Foundation Partnership Meeting. We'll meet again on Wednesday, November 18th with the program starting at 1340 p.m. GMT. As mentioned before, please do make use of the platform now throughout the week and beyond to connect with fellow participants via the People tab. See you on Wednesday, and I hope you have a great partnership meeting week. Goodbye and stay safe.